Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Precious Porritz, Assistant Vice Provost for Student Affairs. Thank you so much for joining our lecture series this evening. This is part two of a three-part lecture series. Uh, and so if you joined us last week, thank you for joining us. If you are not able to join us, um, that lecture is available on African African American Studies YouTube channel. Um, so you can access it there. And then this one will be recorded and available as well. Um, so if Dr. Walcott is dropping knowledge bombs, you may want to watch it a second or a third time. Uh, and so this evening, um, this, this actually this lecture series is brought to you by um, African African American Studies. American Studies in the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And we will be giving out copies of Dr. Walcott's newest book um, on property. So that will be available for the first 50 people who signed up with a .ku.edu uh, email address, um, courtesy of the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And so they're pleased to offer those books for your reading. I've got a copy, I haven't read it yet, um, but I have read his article, The End of Diversity, uh, and it was brilliant. And so I wanna share a few pieces of that um, that really stuck with me. And in particular, um, there are just some pieces that move me every time I read it. And so as I was preparing for tonight's lecture, um, pieces that really stuck with me um, from that article. <clears throat> one line, the paradox that we find ourselves in is one in which even to dissenter whiteness and produce a different kind of world, we find ourselves working to pacify whiteness so that other possibilities might emerge. Um, that just really is sitting with me and in my soul this week and in the past couple of weeks. Um, and the article ends with this line. Um, for me, diversity has reached its end because as Ahmed says, has strongly suggested in On Being uh, Included, uh, institutions use diversity to produce the effect of not being racist and to preempt more radical trans transformative change that requires new collective um, uh, imaginaries and modes of being in the world. Imagine anew yet again and always. So again, different passages sit with me uh, depending on what I'm dealing with in the current week or month or even day. Uh, as I've revisited this piece. I read it for the first time last fall, um, but I am constantly referencing it. And if you ask um, my former d and &E team, I have sent it to them twice and encouraged them to read it because the piece is brilliant. And I really do look forward to reading the On Property book um, as well. And so you can get a copy um, if you are one of the first 50 people to sign up. Um, but as we move through the evening, um, I'm, gonna, I'm shortly gonna turn it over to Dr. Walcott so that you can hear some of his brilliance. Um, if you have questions, there is a Q&A function, uh, and so you can drop those questions in the Q&A. They'll all be answered at the end of the lecture, uh, and Dr. Alexander from African American Studies will be uh, moderating that Q&A for us, so you can drop it in there. I'd also strongly encourage you to engage with us on Twitter using hashtag diversity at KU, um, and you can read the tweets from last week's conversation, uh, and we'd encourage you to continue to use that um, Twitter account for this week's conversation as well to engage with each other. Uh, and like I said, there are over 200 people registered um, for this webinar just tonight uh, and not just at KU. So it gives you an opportunity to engage with folks who are interested in this conversation from all across the world and even from Canada because Dr. Walcott is joining us um, from Canada this evening where we had 72 degrees and it's a bitter negative six there. So I, I'm glad I live in Kansas. I don't know. Um, but Dr. Walcott's professor in women and gender studies um, in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto, uh, and his uh, research is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies, gender, and sexuality. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Walcott, um, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you so much, um, Assistant Vice Provost Pet Pre Precious. Patras for the lovely introduction and for reading my work and sharing it and citing it. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, when one writes and puts stuff out, you never know how it's going to be taken up. I also want to thank Professor Sean Alexander and Professor David Rudiger and the African American Studies Department, um, your students and colleagues for inviting me to participate in this um lecture series tonight um 
it's a great pleasure to participate in the speaker series alongside um, Professor Rod Ferguson, who I've known, I think we've known each other since we were graduate students presenting our work at American Studies Association. And Professor Barbara Ransby, whose work has taught me so much about radical history and politics. And for those of you who are able to make it here tonight, thank you for coming out. Um, the talk, let me begin with four short guide quotes and say something about why I chose them. So the first quote comes from Bill Haver uh, from an essay he wrote in 1999 called, called Another University Now, a practical proposal for a new foundation of the university. And you'll hear Bill Haver echo in my comments tonight quite a lot. Um, he writes, let me be blunt. I do not think there has been, is, or can ever be an equitable institution. Institutions do not, cannot, by virtue of their institutionality, be equitable. If by equity, we mean a certain symmetry, a certain equality, and therefore a certain outside to power. And I return to Bill Haver's essay often because I think it offers a profound critique of how to think about and how to rethink the university. The second one comes from Sarah Ahmed's What's the News on the Newses, on the Newses of News from the chapter on news and the university in which Ahmed turns to the news of diversity in its many forms and guises and then seeks to unmake the news of diversity. And Sarah Ahmed writes, diversity is often used to signal a kind of commitment to something, including the commitment to change, change as diversification. The third one comes from Stuart Hall's cultural, cultural studies and its theoretical legacies which is an essay again that I return to often. And it's Hall's kind of non-account of the development of cultural studies as a field. But I really engage this essay as a document or a guide for how to think about my own scholarly work and what intellectual work as a practice of politics should do. So I quote from Hall here as he's writing about cultural studies, but I think we could actually replace that phrase cultural studies with the phrase EDI or diversity or what have you. My fear at that moment was that if cultural studies gained an equivalent institutionalization in the American context, it would, in rather the same way, formalize out of existence the critical questions of power, history, and politics. The critical questions of power, history, and politics. And the fourth one comes from Bill Reddins and his book, The University in Ruins, a book that I think we all should be reading on the corporate university, the attacks on the, the ongoing attacks on the humanities, and our collective complicity with all of it. Um, Reddins writes, excellence is thus the integrating principle that allows diversity, and he puts it in quotes, the other watchword of the university prospectus, to be tolerated without threatening the unity of the system. And you know, I think that Bill Reddings lays out the stakes in the university on the rooms in not uncertain terms of the university's relationship to capital and its perpetuation among many other insights in that book. But those four quotes are really the signposts and the guide for what I'm gonna to try to say tonight. So in this talk tonight, I want to return to two essays that I have written in the last few years to accentuate the stakes of our contemporary moment of equity, diversity, and inclusion, or DEI as some call it. I really can't use DEI or DEI because that is the last name of a colleague of mine from Ghana. So EDI it is for me. The two essays overlap in their concerns. The first essay is called Against Social Justice and the Limits of Diversity or Black People and Freedom. 
and it was published in a collection edited by my colleague, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang called Toward What Justice? Describing Diverse Dreams of Justice in Education. And the second essay, which Dean Potras mentioned, is called The End of Diversity and was published in Public Culture. Some of you may have read one or both of these essays. In these essays, I attempt to make the case that the language of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and even social justice has run its course. A language already compromised, languages already compromised, and that these languages can no longer do the work that we want them to do. What if we are, what that we want them to do? If what we are after is called freedom, I argue in both essays, then this language can no longer get us there. So in this talk tonight, I will restrict my lens to the university as a site of struggle and think out loud with you about how this deeply compromised language of EDI, of equity, diversity, and inclusion, works to keep the status quo in place, all the while using representation of evidence of a change that is no change at all. I'll ap I apologize in advance if I'm sometimes a bit rhetorical, but having studied and labored in both protests and employment related to these concerns, this field and its politics, I feel a deep sense of anguish about what is presently being undertaken under the rubric of EDI. The return of long discredited ideas like unconscious bias and other ideas that both individualize and simultaneously keep the structure of the inequitable university intact has usurped ideas like justice, social justice and, equal, and equity as a way to predict the demand for another university now, or to borrow from Haver, a new foundation of the university. So let me begin with some clarity then. Equity, diversity, and inclusion cannot produce the university we need if the university we need, if the university we need is one engaged in the larger project of justice and freedom. If another university is needed now, EDI cannot get us there. EDI reproduces that which we already have, an inequitable university. EDI does not destabilize power in the institution. Instead, it restabilizes power by acceding to the university, the clear prerogative to appear to redistribute the resources of the university, all the while keeping in place the concentration of power institutional arrangements and the institutional legitimizing force to both practice and regulate the force of institutionality as power itself. Once we come to terms of the idea that the university as institution is beyond reform, another set of concerns take center stage. Before I turn to those concerns, let me walk you through a brief sketch of how I arrive where I'm at now. So I always think from where I'm located and I'm thinking from outside the geography, from, I'm thinking from inside the geography of the nation state of Canada. So in 1971, the Canadian government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau announced multiculturalism as federal policy in Canada. This policy was meant to interrupt more radical political demands for national accountability from white ethnics, racial minorities, women and gay and lesbian people. And it worked to make diversity a discursive re re rearrangement of the national imaginary. This rearrangement was crucially successful in reorienting how Canada understood itself as a multicultural nation, at least performatively, without divesting of its white colonial dual settler identity as French and English. Eve Hawke in her 20, 2012 book, Multiculturalism Within a Bilingual Framework, Language, Race and Belonging in Canada, summed it up this way, and I quote, this projection, both domestically and internationally, this projection of multiculturalism, of Canada as a multicultural, bilingual, tolerant, and diverse nation 
not only severs the link to the mother country, but also grounds the formation of a distinct Canadian identity in opposition to other nation states." End quote. The project of multiculturalism thus in part came to skillfully manage Canadian racial others as it inducted the white ethnics into the national family while legitimating the continued reign of white people and the culture as, of whiteness as the measure of attainment and importantly, as the legitimate site of achievement. And of course, for not white people, the measure of whiteness was and remains an unattainable measure. It's important to note that the kinds of social movements that made multicultural policy a necessity were sweeping across North America and other parts of the world and that what comes to be called multiculturalism in Canada was merely a response that mirrored other responses elsewhere, but without the same name. The language of diversity, of difference and of representation came to mark this period of the 1960s uprisings and the insurgent movements that modern capitalism and its institutions sought to defeat or at least disrupt. We have been living, living the long jury of this political interruption. As resurgent social movements of all kinds expose the unattainable measure of whiteness in a multicultural post 60s world, for those who are not marked as white, it did not take long for multiculturalism as both a set of ideas and policies to meet its own crisis. The crisis was not simply one of the national imaginary and governmental institutions, but all of the legitimating institutions that constitute the social and political regimes of the ruling order. It is in part my argument that the crisis of multicultural legitimacy also therefore spiraled into the university, given its central role in the reproduction of nation power and institutionality beyond itself into other spheres as well. We cannot be more forceful about what the movements of the 1960s meant for national reorder across North America. These nations were on the brink. 1968 is still reverberating and those reverberations continue to shape the contemporary university. The project of representative inclusion that gave rise to ethnic studies, women's studies, and Black studies in the USA and elsewhere are also underwritten by more general discourses of multiculturalism too. These programs played and continue to play a dual role. On the one hand, these programs appear as a torn in the side of the vastly conservative university. And at the same time, these programs are the example that the university can use to make, the, to make its claim as a place of democratic and open debate. And even as these same programs find themselves subject and subjected by ongoing criticism and financialized measure, measurements meant to impede the knowledge claims that come out of them, these programs thus allow the university to retain one of its most fundamental myths as a place of open, unbridled inquiry. And these programs are often where something called diversity lives in the university as well. It's multicultural character, so to speak. And last but not least, these programs are often the cheapest on any campus. And yet, and yet to establish a new program on any campus of these kinds, can plunge that campus into a tremendous anxiety. It is truly a remarkable circumstance to witness. Part of the crisis of multiculturalism was its ability to demonstrate diversity, but not to inhabit the kind of change where diversity would actually be the font of the transformation of the society. At the institutional level, multicultural diversity had very little negligible impact on institutions, and thus the shorthand dismissal of saris, samosas, and steel bands came to characterize the period. 
The critique of diversity from the late 1970s to the 1980s was so profound and devastating that new languages had to be invented in which the work of thinking living together better could be reconceived. Nowhere was the evidence of this invention more plentiful than in debates between black feminists, feminists of color, and liberal and radical white feminists of the period. We can read Audre Lorde's work through these debates. We can read Bell Hooks' works, early works through these debates, the anthologies of home girls, but some of us are brave and countless other conferences and festivals and, and anthologies that sought to intervene into the terms of a multicultural discourse that, that could not produce its material effect for non-white people. And you know, recently there's a lot of circulating around um, Cornel West's um, um, current struggles with Harvard. But in that period, it, well, Cornel West has a really wonderful and important article called The New Cultural Politics of Difference that really speaks to this period and, uh, in, in a really important way. Uh, but I'm going to turn to the work of the Indo Canadian. Um, social theorist, Marxist social theorist, feminist social theorist, Himani Banerjee, who would have been writing in the ni late 1980s um, a critique of difference, but published in 1991. And Banerjee writes, and I quote, our difference, and she puts that in quotation, is then not simply a matter of diversities that she has in quotation, which are being suppressed arbitrarily but a way of noting and muting at the same time fundamental social contradictions and antagonisms. The concept of difference with its emphasis on expression, textual, linguistic view of social reality obscures these antagonisms at the level of everyday life and overall national and international social and economic organization, end quote. You can already hear enfolded in the critique from Banerjee a refusal of strategies like unconscious bias in favor of a social and economic account. And, and enfolded in her critique are also other forms of accounting for racist behavior in favor of a political position that makes the social appear, as William Haver names it. It is important to know that this kind of critique comes in a moment when diversity as an idea and organizing principle run its course. That is when diversity does not produce the kinds of structural change that, began to, that can begin to lay the foundation for epochal change. So this deeply striking that diversity once discredited and abandoned by at least the mid to late 1980s has so forcefully returned as an orienting term for addressing the university in our present time. We can see more clearly how, we can see more clearly now how multicultural inclusion interrupted 1980s anti-racist movements um, across North America and how radical feminists of color and black feminists responded to um, that interruption. And indeed, when we look to that period, what we see are Black feminists and feminists of color doing a significant body of work that really seeks to analyze and make sense of the ways in which the state was intruding in our lives through a series of different kinds of institutions, from public schooling to universities to um, the welfare apparatus, um, to um, reproductive justice and so on. But part of what I'm suggesting is that diversity is a synonym for multiculturalism, which was already a synonym for multiracial, which was also, which was always already positioned against black people in blackness or the deselected others as Sylvia Winter has termed it. It was this kind of thinking that I entered graduate school attuned to, deeply impacted by, and deeply impacted by what was then called the cultural wars, and closer to home, 
um, the Black theory wars with Black postmodernism, deconstruction, and poststructuralism arrayed in contest and debate against Afrocentrism. Those of us who lived through that period and remember it, you know, the archetypes of that moment would be Henry Louis Gates versus Asante. And there's a wonderful um, 60 Minutes program where Gates, Asante, and and um, and others appear to debate um, these these questions. Um, as a young master's student, it was in that context. It was that context that led me to begin my my study of Black life through an examination of multiculturalism and diversity, and the technologies of ongoing white supremacy's method that interrupted our political desires to move us towards something like liberation. I wrote my master's thesis called some, I wrote a master's thesis called something like From Multicultural Critique to Anti-Racist Education. And at the time of writing, anti-racism had emerged as the acceptable term and politics, as well as idea that would, that would rescue us from the trick of multicultural inclusion. Anti-racism very quickly became cannibalized too, though, by all the by by all the institution by by the institutional power and authority. And in fact, anti-racism now I would argue operates as the opposite side of multiculturalism. Um, that the two of the two terms um, and the kinds of practices that get organized around the two terms need each other to make sense. Indeed, in both of the essays that this talk is based on, I argue that anti-racism is a term and idea as tainted as diversity. And let me pause and say that my argument is in no way, it, it's not one about the purity of words or terms, but rather about what those terms or words can be activated to make happen. I have come to believe that the language of anti-racism has now come to occupy the opposite side of multiculturalism. The two words are now locked in a mutual embrace in which invoking one or the other means the same thing. Words propel a certain kind of imagination and those words now limit what we might think and what we have come to believe is possible. By this I mean that anti-racism and multiculturalism have, come, have become performative rather than structural interventions into the collective institutional regimen of our lives. Indeed, by making such a claim, I'm suggesting that much of the language that we presently have or use to articulate possible different futures has run its course. And this language now includes EDI. I am one of those people who believes that language matters. Apologies, my talk just disappeared. <laughs> Okay, I'm one of those people who believes that language matters, that it structures what we can imagine and what we can achieve practically. In most cases, the language has been, in the most cases that the language has been adopted, co-opted and deracinated by institutional and corporate power, especially the university. In fact, in fact, I would argue that the university is killed at this co-optation. As an institution, the university exercises its power to claim to engage a process of reform that is never fully a reflection of its institutionality as power itself. By so doing, the university has been able to establish and maintain a mode of doing and being that as Haver writes, quote, really have they devoured their most cogent critics with such appetite and apparent lack of indigestion, end quote as keeping things perfectly the same. To put it this way, the university has been diversifying since the 1960s. And we can look around and see where we are, where we are everywhere. What the university has been skilled at doing is using diversity to dole out benefits that serve its status quo interests, that interrupts revolt, and preempts takeover. 
It is precisely that such language can find a home in the normative institutions of late modernist capital, the language of EDI, especially, especially the university that betrays the language's inability to render possible new imaginaries for reorganizing life of all kinds. <clears throat> I often turn to Adolf Rees Jr.'s notion of demobilization to help me think about what came out of the 60s, what was so possible, what was interrupted. And of course, Adolf Reed Jr. has this really, I think, important and necessary for engaging um, critique of the race relations industry and how race relations management um, produced what he calls um, a kind of demobilization. And he writes at one point, the regime of race relations management as realized through um, a four pronged dynamic that he that he discusses in, 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 in this article and, and the book um, that, that ex has exerted a demobilizing effect on what on black politics, precisely by virtue of its capacities for delivering benefits, and perhaps more important, for defining what benefits political action can legitimately use to pursue. And, and, and in some ways, this notion of defining what benefits political action can legitimately be used to pursue is what EDI now occupies. So in my view, Reese analysis works across all the mid 60s movements as those movements have come to be incorporated into the existing logics and structures of late modernist capitalism, reaping benefits for few, but producing the assumptive logics that such benefits are as are extendable to all. Significantly, when we look at such practices in their this, in this specificity, what we see most clearly is that the extension of benefits not only demobilize more radical calls for transformation, but also simultaneously produce disposable populations in their wake. Such performative gestures, rather than structural destruction, are currently the means whereby late modern capital um, continues to devour its critics as, as, as I point to Haver. What Haver is alerting to us to in his striking metaphor, metaphorical language, is how the university demobilizes radical demands. EDI is a demobilization, but not only is it a demobilization, it is also a reordering of value. It is precisely for this reason that the value of inclusion in the many senses and ways that value might be invoked, especially in its, man monetary, in its monetary and racial logics, requires a rigorous re-engagement. So the 60s is a touchstone for this talk for, many, for a number of reasons. The 60s insurgencies social movement insurgencies deeply rattled the institutionality of the university. And in its compromise of allowing the interdisciplines to enter, as Rod Ferguson has pointed out, the university had, had to figure out how to reorder itself without giving up power. It is my argument that EDI is now deployed as not just the retention of power, but as the demobilization of political demands and the reordering of value. I have argued that where the 60s movements movement stall was in their inability to adequately and radically rethink and put in place and put in place in their own movements and then beyond their movements, a different and sustainable idea of value. An understanding of value that could reside outside of late modern capitalist logics that was immune to the seductive pull of inclusion and performative rhetoric of representation of bodies, identities, and communities. Lynn Barrett writing with the contested theorizations of value has asserted that, and I quote, to impose no alternative value in the theoretically neutral moment of calling value into question remains equivalent to strengthening and reincarnating reified dominant value. And I think that that is in many ways 
um, a, a really thoughtful insight that can help us to understand why if the 60s insurgent movements weren't totally defeated, that they were so, uh, so significantly interrupted. That the social movements of the mid 60s in the broadest sense did not rethink value or only at their most radical extreme was it approached means that the promise of a different order of planetary life was immediately compromised and the conditions for incorporation made possible and therefore manageable in the already existing order and structure. The conditions therefore became adaptable to include without substantive structural change. Again, as a kind of pessimistic aside, let me be clear that the benefits won by those movements are not meaningless, but rather we must now come to see how those come to see those benefits for what they are. One at the expense of deepening an already deadly and death-driven culture. A death-driven culture that proffered equality as the promise of inclusion, knowing full well that under the arrangements of the promise, equality could only function as a fiction of the social. In the aftermath of the post 60s moment, the state's institutions, including the university, could not produce anything that might look like equality. Post 60s disappointment was forced to invent new terms to make the active refusal of a new post 60s settlement appear as the norm and the idea of equity took shape and form in that context. The idea of equity sought to fix a problem that equality could not achieve, that of leveling the field of encounter so that outcomes might somehow line up for all. So, indeed, equality, at least conceptually speaking, was and is premised on the world as it is presently arranged. And thus it must produce and trade in a fiction of access that its radical shortfall has no way of accounting for. The, the critique of equality is therefore important in that it provides a different and dare I say, a better account of the world as we know it and experience it. Since we know that folks encounter institutions from radically different histories, histories of degradation and oppression versus histories of incorporation and legitimization, if not ownership, and therefore cannot by any ethical or material measure experience similar or even the same outcomes. Let me say that I am a critic of equity as it is currently practiced and articulated. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the idea of equity remains an important one. And it's an important idea that is best understood in my view as a transitional idea. I would begin to give you a history lesson on equity, but suffice to say that my detour through multiculturalism to begin to give you a more robust idea of the way in which I understand the importance of equity as an idea and how it might come into practice as a causeway to a different kind of, a different kind and set of human relations and thus life forms. In my view then, equity is only an opening, a beginning, a bridge. The contradiction of equity is that one must continually ask what is being reached for, what is being desired, why and for whom, and in what context. Asking very basic questions about what equity might do, should do, and achieve seems to make the idea and practice unravel as it seems if justice is not also present. The idea of equity is not possible if the world as it is presently organized is our starting point and end point. That is, if inclusion is what is actually sought. Indeed, equity as an idea offers us an opening to think about how global inequities frame our everyday lives above the macro and micro levels. But if our project for planetary survival is to be about more than us, then we need to be clear that equity in the context of our present way of life must dis disavow our inheritance of post Columbus exploits of, of post columbus exploits and requires now a new epochal shift. 
Such a shift means asking what should equity do in the meantime? My argument is that in the meantime, equity would not make a case for diversity and inclusion. In the post 60s moment, the university became populated with offices of human rights, anti-racism and so on to manage the problem of race and I would argue blackness in particular. These offices again failed to manage disappointment, protests, and demands for more radical change. And by the 2000s, these offices mostly became married bound. It was the movement for black lives that resuscitated these institutions. And in that moment, a strategic move occurred. These offices found themselves liquidated in favor of EDI at the senior management level. EDI came to replace those offices and to operate from a new belief in the sutured narrative of adequate potential and possible representativity for not white, not white life in the institution. Further, EDI was able to take up and repurpose the foundation of the university and its thought or idea it's locked and thus it's taught our idea is locked into the performative discourse of excellence and merit as encapsulated in the nonsense phrase inclusive excellence. EDI took as its purview the very ideas that made its demand necessary in the first instance to stake its claim to, un to transform the university. A con job by any other name. What was even more skillful was that faculty and students led the charge for EDI at the senior management levels, hoping that a seat at the table for already compromised ideas could be transformative. It allowed the university to appear responsive, responsive to radical demands that were no longer radical. EDI then is forced to adopt the same terms and conditions to be intelligible on the terms of the very system it claims to want to remake. Let me read that again, because that's really at the core of my argument. EDI then is forced to adopt the same terms and conditions to be intelligible on the terms of the very system it claims to want to unmake. Indeed, we might now see how EDI is a perform as a performative discourse functions to obscure rather than to specify, and thus is a demobilizing force on campuses everywhere. The Maritbang Human Rights Offices, Cultural Sensitivity Offices for faculty, staff, and students are now re-energized and reordered under the umbrella of newly announced EDI leaders. The new context turns towards vice presidents, vice provosts, provosts of EDI, and we are told that the, idea, that the issues of equity, diversity and inclusion are at the main table and now reorienting its work. The truth of the matter is that many universities after 9-11, at least in North America, but I would say in, in, in parts of Europe too, realized that human rights offices operating at lower levels, in, 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 sorry. The truth of the matter is that many universities after 9-11 quickly realized that human rights offices operating at lower levels in the institution were more dangerous for community building and supporting radical campus politics by sponsoring speakers and events and, imp and importantly, fostering a protecting student activism. Senior EDI positions gave them the opportunity to create new portfolios at the senior management levels to get rid of this problem and manage from the center of the institution. These senior management positions makes it appear that the issue at hand is being given serious and high level treatment, all the while interrupting more radical campus demands. This is mobilization at the site of the EDI office in its most blatant guise. And even more importantly now at the senior management table, the resources are reproportioned for organizing lectures with high profile figures of corporate EDI, panels, awards, conferences, trainings, 
and acting as motivational speakers of the senior administration unleashed on the rest of us. It is an institutional lie that we all become complicit with. It, it is an institutional lie that we all become complicit with that EDI as a program of change must live at the senior, senior management level to make it actually work. If, if we were to begin to think curriculum at departmental and program levels, attached to hiring, graduate training, and other mechanisms of reproduction, we would begin to change the university. And just a couple of days ago, there was a really interesting report on University of Carolina, North Carolina, Greensboro, that, that looked at um, diversifying efforts there outside of this logic of EDI and, 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 and how successful it had been. EDI allows the local to carry on as usual. And where the local is mostly white, which is the totality of the university, it will largely reproduce whiteness. This is the hard truth of the current university. Can you imagine a major literature department deciding, rethinking its curriculum and hiring only in black literature for the next 10 years or a sociology department or a philosophy department? We could go on. No EDI that I know of has that kind of an incentive to lead this kind of initiative. And none of the traditional disciplines will want to take on this kind of experiment. Why? Because it will radically, radically alter the university as we know it. Some things will become minor as they rightly should be. The forgetful invention of EDI is crucial to know because it rides off of struggle because it writes off of the struggle, it forgets its own history of struggle, quickly to engage in the fictional reorder of the institution as now more equitable because the EDI provost exists. Indeed, one of the paradoxes is that many of these positions are filled by our former colleagues who we know and who we believe to have good intentions. These positions now filled with our colleagues plucked from the ranks of the teaching factory floor demonstrate that we too can inhabit the highest riches of the institution. Engaged in the distribution of resources is mutual. These offices must now accrue to themselves spheres of management, administration, and influence to make sense in an, or in an order that remains largely the same. These colleagues now preside over awards and scholarships for social justice and equity work and prestigious lecture series invited and already well healed as further evidence of their worth. In short, the university proceeds as usual. To speak the reality of this situation is to open oneself up to a critique of jealousy and other nasty accusations. Nonetheless, I know from personal experience of, of almost arriving for interviews for some of these positions and then withdrawing that the position becomes more important than the institution than what it is alleged they actually want to do. That is, the full force of EDI is not to transform the institution, but the point, but to point, but the point of the EDI office, but to point to the EDI office as transformation in and of itself. The full force of EDI is not to transform the institution, but to point to the EDI office as transformation in and of itself. Universities will insist on hiring in these eight areas, even when they suspend hiring in other areas, because the position simply speaks their desire to do better. Nothing more needs to be done after, except for the award shows, panels, and motivational talks of best practices to departments, faculties, and other units of the university. None of this produces equity, of course. It does, however, garner lots of attention. The insurgent multidisciplines of women's studies, ethnic studies, and black studies that emerged out of the 1960s and began to construct a foundation for a different kind of university 
are no longer where the intent of diversity lives in the university. Seldom are the EDI experts drawn from these interdisciplines where scholars have a critique of the university as institution. Instead, those selected often take on EDI as a passion project, not a studied one, most often motivated by some personal workplace slight. And while one's impulse does not have to begin and end in the place of the slight or thwarted professional goals, it is clear that the institution of the university recognizes how to perpetuate its normal through this kind of selection of individuals whose ambitions secure EDI as their personal achievement. EDI is now largely located in the desire to reform the disciplines. And this in and of itself reproduces the conservative, normative, white supremacist corporate university. In fact, the interdisciplines come under scrutiny and attack in the new EDI environment because even in their worst incarnations, meaning the worst incarnations of the interdisciplines, they remain sites of vital critique of the university as form and institution. Take, for example, what is called mentoring. EDI offices haven't committed themselves to inclusive excellence, that nonsense frame, phrase, now seek to enshrine it through a suite of mentorship programs. What we used to call role models, and my, my good friend and colleague Warren Critchlow has a, a wonderful essay that is an amazing critique of the role model discourse. What we used to call role models has been transformed in the universe for Black, Indigenous, and POCs as mentoring. Mentoring works to reproduce the very exclusive practices and labor secrets of the institution as a mode of individual survival in it. The argument against exclusion is now remobilized as one for ex exclusive inclusion and shared out as in piecemeal form as mentorship. It is in examples like mentorship that the very serious limits of EDI are revealed. What is revealed is that EDI is not committed to another foundation of the university, but, but to preserving the inequitable foundations with a few adjustments. We have been here before. So I'm moving towards a conclusion. Couple paragraphs. A struggle over the ideas of these terms or languages, what they actually mean, what they might do, and, and, and what these languages might reproduce um, from their initial promise. Um, my sense is that these terms are now so deeply enmeshed in institutional and corporate power that such a struggle will not contribute much to the project of liberation and an anti-capitalist world, and definitely not to undoing the university in its present form. In short, justice can't be had. I would even dare say approach if such languages, if these languages they remain fundamental to our present desires for different life worlds. But the call here is not to just throw the words out though, but to recognize their limits and truncated politics and thus to mark them as performative utterances meant to signal that which we cannot ever produce. In short then, what I want to propose, in short then, in short then, I want to propose that the engagement with and articulation of a possible decolonial future might risk being uttered and that such an utterance begins in the acknowledgement that our present political settlement is profoundly compromising the university by EDI. Last paragraph. I am a scholar whose work has been committed to thinking these problems through Black life. In both of the essays I mentioned at the beginning, I concluded my thoughts on what I call a pure decolonial project for drawing from Jacques Derrida's pure hospitality. I now want to risk it all here with you and suggest the foundation for a different university will begin with what Spivak years ago in teaching against the machine, I, sorry, in against the teaching machine 
ask us to risk our specialism. EDI needs us committed to our specialism as the mode through which to reproduce the institutional power of the university, as if it is not power at all, but forms of negotiation among equals. A pure decolonial project, one that might lay the foundation for another university, it's one that would begin to insist on an entirely different measure of contribution. It would abolish excellence and merit and other modes of measurement and evaluation that can only make sense in the economy of scarcity, both material and otherwise. A pure decolonial project would unhinge knowledge from capital, and indeed the university would be among the most vital sites for the unmaking of capital as a regime of ordering life. A pure decolonial project of and in the university would take white supremacy in all its forms, but most importantly, its banal quotidian expressions which is to say it would take the university as neutral as the very thing it sets its sights on undoing. Show me an EDI office doing that, and I will show you where the work has began. Thank you. Wonderful, Ronaldo. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind everyone that we have a uh, question and answer. Uh, the, the question and answer is open, uh, so you can go ahead and posit your questions in there, and we'll go ahead and, and go through them. What I always love about your your talks, your your writing is is your your discussion of language, and I, I and your 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 connection with language and just the the discussion of the importance of language. And I kept coming back, you know, you kept repeating it, but it also, you know, I kept thinking of things like performative status quo, demobilization, right? Um, those things, those words. When we think about um, EDI is, you know, as, as you say, with it, you know, um, I think that we, those are not words that we come to easily, right? But, and you're trying to interject them into this discussion. I think that's extremely important, right? Um, as we, as we think about this. So you know, I'm just, I love the way that you talk about language. So I appreciate that. And, and thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. So. But I think that language does something to what kind of politics we practice and what we can imagine. And so I think that, you know, language is this kind of foundation, the foundation from which we move. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we speak it and then we try to bring it into, into action. Right, absolutely. Well, speaking about language, uh, one of the <laughs> questions we have here is, is about the um, you know that first say that it's a great talk for you and they they encourage people to go read on property which i do as well um as well as all of your other works um i i wonder they wonder if uh, what are your thoughts and reflections are on the language and deployment of what they call the origami term of b-i-p-o-c <laughs> look i mean look one of the things that has happened in the last, you know, decade or so has been, has been the attempt to think the specificity of racial imagine, imagined groups, but still to hold them in some kind of relation. And what we call BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, is, is one of those, um, one of those shorthand terms that you know, it, it wants to account for the specificity of blackness, indigeneity, people of color, but it also wants to hold them in relation. And that's why I ended the talk tonight by turning to Spivak and this idea of risking our specialism. That while I myself think the world through the lens of, of black life, it's increasingly becoming clear to me that our inability to also think the world together is a significant failure of those of us who are interested in laying the foundation for real epochalship. That we have become, if you will, so deeply mired in our own specialism of our ethnic group, our national order, 
or phenotypic look and so on, that a more radical politics is being deeply, deeply undermined by a commitment to, you know, to, to, to crib off of Paul Gilroy, a commitment to our camps. And while I by in no means want us to return to some romance of a previous politics in which all oppression is flattened out and we understand the um, and we understand uh, the ways in which uh, white supremacy and capitalism is launched all of us as somehow the same. Um, there's no need to do that. I think that we have to kind of figure out what is the nature of the cross-cultural resonance that can produce a politics that really engages, you know, Sylvia Winter says, you know, we need a shift that is something like the Copernican shift. And and so that's where I'm that's why I'm using the language of this epochal shift. You know, I'm drawing really from Sylvia Winter. And that can't that can't happen simply among black people or simply among indigenous people or simply among POCs or simply among a radical, the radical left, white, or what have you. So we are in urgent need of finding ways to activate conversations that can wrench us out of or specialism, because I think our specialism um, is leading us to further and further defeats and allowing a conservative, um, late modern capitalist um, order of the world to drive us all towards collective death. Well, a related question, how, how have indigenous critiques of Canadian universities and their diversity projects intersected with black radical critiques? And do EDI strategies discourage such intersection? Well, I mean, at the level of Canadian institutions, there, 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 there are two things that are happening on track, on, on similar tracks, and which is that you've got EDI and you've got the language that, that either alternates between indigenization or decolonization but really shrouded through a whole politics of what they're calling reconciliation. But I mean, all of that is really language of EDI. All of that is really language of, um, of a logic of diversifying in which, you know, um, there's a desire to bring representative bodies largely marked through phenotype um, into the institution, but leaving the institution firmly intact as it always has been. Um, so, um, of course, there are antagonisms around access to resources because what EDI does on the one hand and indigenization or reconciliation, whatever name um, a particular institution might give it, is that um, the order of knowledge that keeps the institution intact um, is that resources are scarce. So, uh, these new people, these new folks being bought into the university through, through these logics are also competing for the same pool of resources in, in, in interesting fashion and interesting ways. And so that's, that's, that's again, uh, to go back to this, and that's why I think that, you know, activating the conversation about risking our specialism is going to be necessary for us to think beyond the institution and how it's ordering our own desires for transformation. So another person asks, uh, they're wondering if you could talk a bit more about the inclusive excellence. And the term is so pervasive because, you know, uh, in, in its utterance, it assumes that it is doing the work of equity, right? Um, but could you talk a little bit more about your critique or discussion of that, that term? Well, I mean, the, the thing about, you know, nonsense terms like inclusive excellence is that first you have to believe that, um, that the whiteness that has constituted the contemporary university has always been excellent, <laughs> right? So if, 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 you, if you believe that, then you think that to bring others in, to bring those who are not white in, that they have to reach some kind of measure and standard um, that was always already there 
and it's actually kind of inherent and, tr and transparent. So inclusive excellence is already in its formulation um, an acknowledgement that this kind of language and EDI practice can actually transform the institution. It is already an acknowledgement that institutional power is shaping how it is that the project of diversification is happening. Yeah. But also, um, so, so there's that, but also then there's just the kind of question of what constitutes um, measurable, desirable goals of higher education. And of course, in Bill Rennie's university in ruins, he spends a lot of time on packing this idea of excellence as one that is really tied up with the corporate university being able to really market its goods, so to speak. That excellence is not really about the nature of the work that we might do in the institution of the university, but it's really a way to corporatize and make apparent um, the, the products that the university might have to put on the market. Um, so, so excellence is not about um, some inherent or neutral, neutral quality that, that we can go out and find in the field and feral and bring it into the university and domesticate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I always laugh. A colleague of both of ours once said, uh, you know, we have a center for teaching excellence on this campus. And they said, of course, you don't have a, a center for teaching adequately, right? You mm -hmm. always had to have that word at excellence and whatever, what does that mean, right? Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, so I agree. New question here. Uh, they say they love the gestures towards challenging the way that the idea of, of mentorship replicates the power structure it aims to dismantle. And they would love to hear more about this idea, especially as mentorship is outsourced and monetized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I've been thinking. A, I've, I've I've been thinking a lot about mentorship in a range of different ways. But I think mentorship in the context of the university, um, first thing presupposes that, that in the contemporary corporate university, that there's a formula to how, one, to how one might proceed and make a life inside of it. It also doesn't adequately account for what we do in the university as labor. And if there's one thing that I'll generalize on academics about is that so many academics don't think well and carefully about what they do as labor. So that mentorship becomes this kind of individual entrepreneurial self. And it becomes a set of trade secrets that can be shared about how to situate your individual self in the best possible way to do the work that you do. And, and by so doing that, you know, mentorship then um, replicates all of the problems that are inherent to the university. Um, but they also, but they also trace and then reproducing all of the disjunctures in the university as well. You know, um, the secrets of who gets paid what the secrets of who gets to teach what, um, all of these kinds. And so what we actually do is, through these logics, is we reproduce the foundational white male patriarchal foundation of the university. And it can never, and, and again, in these practices, they can never measure up to what it is they're attempting to imitate. Um, that because, um, they're already beginning from a place of, for lack of a better word, disadvantage, right? And that's what the, conceptually what equity was supposed to try to interrupt. But instead equity got recast as um, representative bodies as opposed to um, a project that would um, pull everyone in the institution into thinking about the nature of what they of how they did what they did and the consequences of doing it in the manner that they did it. 
Well, another question is, uh, do you think it is possible to subvert EDI, steal from EDI in a way Moten and Harney spoke about, only relationship to the university being a criminal one stealing from, right? Can, you, can we steal from EDI? Well, I mean, look, Moten and Harney are not the, the first to theorize um, what in the 70s and 80s feminists and, and folks in, in education called um, guerrilla tactics in the university. Um, so Moten and Harney theorize it as, as fugitivity, as 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 the on the commons, as seizing the on the commons, um, as stealing from the university, um, and and I understand why that's a persuasive argument, and so on. But it seems to me, and I, and I think that you know radical feminist work um, in what needs to be called the critical pedagogy circulation, you know, the work that people like um, Henry Giroux and Peter McLaren and others did in higher ed in education. And I'm familiar with this work because I trained in, in, a, in, 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 in what became the Faculty of Education at the University of Toronto in a sociology of education department. Um, that these logics of being able to steal from the university have been around for a long time, but their only strategies, like I said in my talk, I used the term causeway or I, or I refer to equity as, as in the meantime. These are only strategies that work in the meantime. And so for me, that's why I moved to the decolonial, to thinking about the decolonial and to think about the pure decolonial, the poor decoloniality, which is to say that at a certain point, we have to breach the strategy of in the meantime and begin to articulate something that, um, that we really wanna fight for as a new foundation towards something else. So it's not so much that I don't think that we can't crib stuff from EDI, but, ED, but we can't keep cribbing. At some point we wanna build something. Mm -hmm. At some point we want to institute a new order of institutionality. At some point we want to overturn the hegemony as it is now and institute a new and different kind of hegemony. And that's where the real struggle, it seems to me, um, becomes at stake. Yeah. I also appreciate the way that you did in this talk and, and you do in most of your work of, of, and you just did in this answer that you, you explain to people there is a history in writing. There's a, there is a field out there, right? And, and we need to know it and know that history of that people have come before and written about similar topics and, and authors don't always reference them, right? And so we should know that, that deep field, especially, um, you know, yeah, especially, I mean, as this example you, you gave, right? You have black feminists writing this stuff much earlier, right? And we should remember that and go, go read those as well and see what we can use to create that new space that you're talking about, right? So, um, Next question is, do you propose a, an exodus from the university toward a kind of mutual aid community, learning or a disavowal of the university as one of the remaining places where curiosity is permitted? In other words, should the university be left behind or rebuilt? Well, I, 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 in the meantime, I propose a takeover of the university. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, We've had upheavals in the university. And that's one of the reasons why 68 kept reverberating in the talk is that, you know, the university was a site of significant embattlement in 68 in France, across North America. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, you know, 68, 69, we have the Sir George Williams affair in Canada, you know, countless other insurgencies across the US. So, you know, the university, has been at the center of managing and learning to interrupt more radical demands for, dare I say, a different kind of democratic future. So I don't, I don't at all believe we should abandon the university. 
I think we should take over the university. And, and what that means is that, of course, we can organize free universities beyond the official institutions that mark themselves as universities. And, and uh, anyone like myself who, you know, a kid born in the 60s and raised in the 70s, you know, I'm accustomed to to education institutions operating outside of formal education of institutions, Saturday schools, Sunday Afrocentric programs and these kinds of things, you know, raid through black nationalism and black power and so on. But but the university, because it is such a crucial network site in how we live our lives, it has to be a site of significant and sustained struggle and eventual takeover. You know, I always line up the university alongside public schooling, policing the carceral system as the kinds of institutions that shape national spaces that have to be struggled with. And we can't simply walk away from it and act like it doesn't have anything meaningful to do in our lives. Again, I'm using use the example of having trained in the faculty of education, you know, Education professors are always involved with governments, shaping policy, shaping your, shaping your children's everyday lives, you know, like to abandon the university to the forces that would intensify capital, that would intensify the brutality of representative democracies that we currently live in um, is not a good political strategy. So here we have another question about hiring practices, right? And uh, you know, what mistakes do you see universities and other organizations making when they are claiming that they're going to go off and strive to hire diverse employees um, mm -hmm. in their policies? Well, there's a bunch of things that happen around around that. One is that so often the the fundamental underpinning logic of of going out and recruiting is one of scarcity. And then quickly followed by the logic of scarcity is the idea that um, these, these, these new hires are going to transform the institution in some way when the institution has no intention whatsoever of being transformed. Unfortunately, the two, the people who are recruited, and this can happen at staff level, student levels, um, faculty levels, they also come believing that they are imbued with some kind of ability to transform systems and structures that are not in no way prepared to be transformed, that there's nothing about the process that suggests transformation is in the making. And yet everybody gets caught up in this fiction that these practices are going to um, produce some kind of transformation. What I think most, most substantively is, what most people don't account for is that the very process that you're now being inducted into is a process being ran and managed largely by people who said they couldn't do it before. <laughs> so, you know, in 2014, the very people who said, we can't, we, we can't imagine how we can hire more black people. In 2018, those very same people could say, well, we're gonna do a cluster hire of 12 people and it's gonna transform what we're doing. Well, what happened in between, right? And, and we're not able to account for what happened in between because what we're not doing is we're not being honest. We're not being honest that these processes are not meant to transform. That what, what happens in between is that we figure out that in fact, yeah, we can hire 12 scholars, we can hire 12 black scholars and nothing about what we do has to change. And in fact, time and time again, we have seen this to be the case. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and about four more questions so far that it's in here. So we'll, we'll go on these. Uh, so what's your take on increasing federalization of grants by universities, departments, and also faculty? How can we re best resist and disrupt this trend? Can you read the first part again? 
So what's your take on the increasing fetidization of grants by universities, departments, and also faculty? Uh, how can we best resist this trend or dis resist and disrupt this trend? So I don't know if they mean grants and around race or DEI or if it's yeah. grants in general. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a hard one for me to answer, but if it's if it's around DEI, I mean, again, that's what I said when I suggested in the paper that a lot of what happens around um, EDI is much more about, in some ways, the publicity of it than actual structural change. And of course, um, the Canadian scene is slightly different, but I have been following um what's happening in the u.s around you know the foundation the foundation um giving out massive grants mm -hmm. or what appears to me to be massive grants for edi in various incarnations and um and i i find that fascinating for a number of reasons um one is one of the things that that reddings is really clear about is the way in which granting structures actually fashion what we think we're doing. So lots of scholars like to think that they've chosen their topics, that they've chosen the things that they're investigating. And what's actually happening is that the money is wagging the dog. <laughs> and so, so we can see, and I, I hope I'm wrong, but I've been watching this, we can see how EDI is in some ways um remaking especially what looks like um the area of black studies and that's uh, you know i saw no noelle rooks and other people tweeting about this recently and and i think it's something that we're going to have to pay attention to especially in black studies as edi money and grant funded money transforms black studies from an interest in black people's lives to a kind of logic of one of diversity and one of increasingly um, being mentored into institutions. Um, so, so there, 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 there's, there's still more thinking that I have to do around that, but clearly there are some flags that are coming up that that I'm going to have to pay attention to moving forward. Yeah, I think I think um, when we look at the the grants and that are being proposed, I, th I mean, you're, I think you're right. What's 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 the motivation? We can go back. I mean, if Rooks is looking at that. Let's go back to also her earlier work, right? In the Ford mm -hmm. Foundations and others, she knows that money exactly. and how to watch that money and where that's going. And of course, State Department involvement in Black Studies and African Studies over the years, we should exactly. pay attention to it. As you're saying, I completely agree. Are Black Studies departments at the risk of elimination by anti-racist centers within universities? <laughs> That's a really good one. You know, I, I, I teach at a place that doesn't, that does not have a Black Studies program. You know, um, it's got a number of anti-racist centers. <laughs> um, look, I, I, that ties into what we were just talking about in, in some ways. And I, I think we have to wait and see um and of course where i end my paper about risk and specialism also complicates this too because i but i would say that in risking our specialism it's not an attempt to make null and void the study of black life but it's to make but it's to raise a set of questions about how the study of black life might allow us to begin to think more for lack of a better word, more holistically about what are the kinds of imperatives to reimagine the world that we all must share together. I think that these anti-racism centers seek to, um, in a way, produce a flattened discourse of race, a flattened discourse of race that we have seen before. And by so doing, these anti-racism centers could actually be really important sites of, again, of demobilizing more radical politics. And so, but that's something that we're gonna to have to pay attention to because they're unfolding as we speak. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're popping up everywhere. Um, 
So here's a long question. So, so bear with me. Uh, and then we'll have two more that are somewhat related and, and not maybe as long, but this one is, it's a long question to read. This person's taking your reference to Adolf Reed seriously. So, so in the late seventies, Adolf Reed wrote um, the black particularity reconsidered, right? Quote, at any rate, things are, have not moved in the emancipatory direction, despite all claims that the protest of the 1960s has extended equalitarian democracy. In general, opportunities to determine one's destiny are no greater now than they were before. More importantly, the critique of life as it is disappeared as a practical activity, i.e. the ethical and political commitment to emancipation seems no long, longer legitimate, reasonable, or valid, um, which means that it imprisons the social past, right? Subverts um, the hope which ends up seeking for the refuge of the predominant forms of alienation, end quote, right? So given this critique that Reed gave us 43 years ago, it is now reasonable to simply consider the university is now an iron cage, impossible to recuperate in a hegemonic moment of neoliberalism and the sadistic nature of EDI. And if so, can you discuss what uh, he what you imagine as another possible world or place outside the university for uh, critical scholarship? Mm -hmm. That's a really, really great question. Yeah. Um, and yes, and, and I can see how that question and 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 the quotations from Reed built into the particular essay that I'm quoting, citing Reed from around demobilization. Because in that particular essay, Reed pinpoints what he calls four moments of of demobilization of black radical politics. It's kind of incorporation of black organizations into um, funding streams and structures as we were just talking about um, the, the way in which the emergence and the deliberate building of a black middle class becomes a buffer between black black um, between white white supremacist practices and working class and poverty people and a range of other practices to demobilize black political movement and demands and so you know, I take seriously the account that he offers and I see a similar kind of thing. And I think the question in and of itself answers itself. Um, the question, a similar kind of thing is happening with EDI. That EDI is saying to a small number of people, we are gonna create pathways for you into institutions like universities but at the expense of demobilizing other more radical demands, other more radical kinds of politics. Because when, once you enter the university on terms that are not changed by, by the EDI explosion, you now have to bunker down and reproduce the university as form to secure tenure and so on, which then scoops in as well, let us mentor you. We're going to send you to these new organizations that now mentor fa Black faculty and faculty of color in the summertime. So if maybe you need to do research where you went to your field and met with people in the summertime, now you're no longer doing that. Now you're going to hang out with other assistant professors and to talk shop and to learn the tricks of the trade, right? These are demobilizing mechanisms that transform the nature of what we do with ideas and knowledge into the kinds of products that the neoliberal university can, can offer as its products to lay capital. So does that mean, again, this comes back to, I'm repeating myself, but this comes back to, does that mean that we abandon university? No. We struggle in the university. We make the university as a, as, as a site of struggle among a range of other sites of struggle because the university is not only a workplace. It's a place that holds the network of societal institutions together. 
And I think that once we keep realizing that the university does that important networking function, we begin to realize that we literally can't uh, abandon university as it presently stands. But we then begin to be much more clear that EDI is a part of the thing that we have to struggle against. Perfect segue into the, to the second to last question here. Um, so as you know, and, and many people who may be listening uh, here know that you know, there's, a, there's a problem at KU. Uh, KU has dismantled or restructured EDI here. And, and the, the office uh, has, has taken some actions or people around the office have taken some actions that are uh, seen as you know, anti-black, you know, homophobic. Uh, could you talk about the hypocrisy of that or maybe not the hypocrisy, the standing of, of, of status quo there, right? Um, but in how students can navigate that at this moment, you know, if the university is a place of struggle, so. Yeah. So that, thank you for that question, because one of the, when I was mentioning in the paper that, you know, between the 80s and, and up to 2000, mid 80s and up to 2000, they developed across university campuses, across North America, all of these human rights offices, um, LGBT offices, you know, a range of sexual harassment offices. And many of those offices operated in kind of a quasi space of kind of reporting to um, senior administrators, maybe in the faculty, sometimes at the at the senior administrative level, but but they operate in this quasi zone, and they did interesting programming. They would find uh, professors of like minds. Um, they had a particular kind of history, institutional knowledge, and so on. By by 2001, in the aftermath of 2001, and heightened Islamophobia on our campus and so on, those offices were initially playing really important roles in bringing speakers, supporting students, and so on. And then the EDI onslaught, the return to diversity and EDI onslaught really came. And many of those offices got literally positioned in the portfolios nowadays of these new vice presidents and vice provosts of EDI and their work got neutered. So that all of a sudden EDI work became a work that was in tension with the work of cultural sensitivity, the work of LGBT um, communities on campus, the work of black students unions and so on. And EDI offices became a function of helping to regulate campus politics so that EDI promises to give us something that it knows it does not intend to deliver, which is a more radical campus, when in fact EDI is engaged in de-radicalizing other offices that had hitherto before provide the basis for um, radical thought on campus. For instance, many of those offices um, especially when I was a graduate student, undergraduate student, would bring through people like Kwame Torre to speak <laughs> in a way that, you know, an EDI office at the, at the level of provost will never do that these days, right? Mm -hmm. You will get Robin DeAngelo. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. Last question, maybe the big question here. Uh, does diversity mean anything in a capitalist system? Well, I think diversity means something. Um, and, but I don't think it means what capital wants it wants us to think it means. Mm -hmm. So you know, diversity. Going back to that idea of of risking our specialism, diversity allows us to revel in our specialism, but it's not the totality of who we are. And and you know, this kind of notion of cross cultural resonance, I get that from Wilson Harris, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the the great Guyanese British writer. And, you know, the cross-cultural resonance is where, you know, the possibilities of inventing the world anew, as Sylvia Winter will have it, um, allows us to begin the ground to imagine new foundations of how to live, live life together. So diversity is not something that has to be stamped out. Um, 
um, difference, cultural difference and difference as we used to call it in the 80s and the 90s is not something that has to be made to disappear, but it has to be something that we understand as a kind of foundation that we can often cross into new modes of living life together differently. Um, so, yeah. It's a great way to, to end it, Ronaldo. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for, for coming and, and speaking with us and, and giving us this great talk. This is that moment, you know, if we were in person, we would all be standing up and giving you a standing ovation. So, you know, you can imagine that in, in the crowd, right? That we're standing here and, and, and clapping for you. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank you for everything you do. Uh, I want to make sure everyone that goes out and gets all of your work, but uh, you've got two books coming out, right? You have one that just was released on property and in a, a book, which is fantastic and a, and a new book called um, The Long Emancipation, which you know, I've read the, you know, the introduction now that people can go read at Duke Press and it's, it's gonna be a, a phenomenal book. And I think people are gonna be reckoning with it for a long time. And I appreciate that. And I look forward to reading it and, and hearing more about that. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you all thank to you. those who have, who have uh, joined us today. I wanna to make sure that everyone does know that we, uh, we have a third talk in this with uh, Barbara Ransby uh, coming. The date has changed from the 18th to the 25th. You will get an email update regarding that date change when we change it in the Zoom schedule, but just to let you know that that has happened. And um, Ronaldo, uh, this is the moment where it's a weird thing, right? Because we're yes. going to hit end and we're all going to disappear. Exactly. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, please stay safe and, and stay warm. And hopefully someday we're going to be sitting there and, and drinking and eating together again, right? Um, yes. So. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.